for those of you who are too hot, for those of you who are too cold, please remember Buddhist climate control, which is, when it's hot, keep a cool head. Don't think about it, worry about it. And when it's cold, keep a warm heart. <laughs> That's called Buddhist climate control. <laughs> So, because sometimes, you know, we have air cons in which make it nice and warm. For some people it's too cold, for some people it's too hot. You can never get exactly what you want in life. Welcome to the world. So sometimes people ask in Dhammaloka, can't we have personal air conditioners just above you with a remote control? Because a lot of times I thought, how are we going to have especially meditation centers, high-tech, I often thought of these meditation cushions or stools people actually sit on. And can't we have them high-tech, this is the 21st century, where you can have a remote control and if your bottom is a bit too sore, you can actually massage it during the meditation. <laughs> or if the leg, you know, the right leg is sore and needs lifting up, you can inflate the right side of the cushion or the left side of the cushion. If it's too cold, you can actually get a blast of cool air a too cold a blast of hot air, and if you have too much sleepiness, you can press another button and get a cup of coffee from your meditation cushion. We can have high-tech cushions, but <laughs> people will still complain. <laughs> so instead of trying to figure out how we can make the world better, we learn how to change our attitude to the world. And it, when you change the attitude, that's something you can do. And then you find it's not the world, but it's the way we look at it, and it causes the problems. And for this evening's talk, I specifically wanted to focus on how we can make our world better by changing our attitude to who we think we are, which is one of the biggest problems of modern people. In Buddhism, we call this identity view. When we start thinking of who we are. And after a while you say, how do you know who you are? Who told you who you are? Even yourself you don't know who you are, let alone other people judging you and telling you who you are. I don't know, throughout my whole life people have been telling me who I am. And I don't believe a word of it. <laughs> Sometimes they criticize you, you stupid monk. Sometimes they praise you, oh you are so wise. I still don't know which one to believe. It's probably somewhere in the middle. Actually, it's not even in the middle. It just goes from one end to the other. Because I do stupid things sometimes. Does that, does that make me a stupid monk? I know all the stupid, silly things which I do in my life. Even just recently, at a waste sack, people were waiting all over the world, here in this center, for me to give them the five Buddhist precepts. When I gave them the five Buddhist precepts, I missed out one. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an, I should know the five precepts, I'm old enough now. But you make mistakes, everybody does. And that makes you human, which is wonderful when you make <coughs> mistakes. But sometimes people make a mistake and I identify with being the mistake. And they think, oh, I'm a hopeless human being, I made a terrible mistake. Story number one, which is really important, with how... You look at other people. There were the two children in the supermarket. I was telling this a few couple of days ago in the Cancer Support Association who came to our monastery. They came, they've been coming every year for 25 years. They've been coming. And they're still not cured yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually they are. That's why they keep coming back. Otherwise they'd be dead. So... 25 years they've been coming. But I was telling them that two kids in the supermarket in the parallel checkout aisles and almost at the same time one kid dropped a jar of honey, splash all over the floor, made a big mess. And almost exactly the same time another kid dropped a carton of milk that went smash and splat all over the floor, made another mess. Now the mother of the kid who dropped the honey said, you stupid kid, 
and the mother of the kid who dropped the milk said that was a stupid thing you did. And the difference is immense. One kid heard they were stupid. The other kid heard they'd done a stupid thing, which was true. So when you understand that story, never ever call your husband stupid. He just did a stupid thing, that's all. Like I did a stupid thing because I forgot the, one of the precepts. But it doesn't make me a stupid monk, I hope. <laughs> and if you remember how we talk to one another, because how we talk with one another and how we relate to one another, people tend to believe what you're told who you are. And because of that, we have all types of problems. Now, the second story, I'm going to work on all these stories as we go along in this talk, was an even more important story for me because I was a school teacher for one year. And because you were a school teacher, this was in UK, you had to do some educational psychology. And this particular, I often mention this particular experiment, it was chilling, it told me a lot about human psychology, not just for kids, but for everybody who's sitting here this evening and the people listening on the internet. This was the story of the two classes of children. At the end of the year, they gave them an exam so they could stream them for the next year. And the thing was, in this exam, they never published the results. There was only the principal and two of the psychologists knew exactly what was going on because once they had marked the exam papers, then they divided all of those 60 children or so into two classes as equally as possible. The child who came top went into the same class as the child who came fifth and sixth, ninth and tenth, 13th and 14th, 17th and 18th, the children who became 2nd and 3rd went in the other class together with the child who came 6th and 7th, 10th and 11th and so on. They split the classes up evenly. And the principal went out of her way to choose teachers for the next year who were equally capable. And classrooms with equal facilities, everything was as equal as they possibly could make it except for one thing. They called one class A and the other one <laughs> class B. <laughs> and it was a chilling experiment because you can imagine what happens. Half the children tell their parents, Daddy, Daddy, I got into class A next year. And Daddy says, that really is mind-boggling. You haven't done any work all year. But never were mine. I'm proud of you, son. Have some extra pocket money. And these other hard-working girls doing all their homework all the time, extra studies. I'm in class B, mummy. Right. No more going out, ballet dancing. No more going out to your parties. No more watching TVs. You're going to have to work harder. That's the parents. Because they assumed class A were the top half and class B were the bottom half. And so did the teachers. The teachers actually aimed their lessons at a higher level. They expected more from the Class A kids. And even the Class A kids themselves thought they were better. An assumption, Class A is always class better than Class B. So 12 months later, when they repeated the exam, kids in Class A did so much better than the B class kids. Exactly as you would have expected if they were the top half from the year before. What had happened is they became Class B kids because they believed the assumptions what Class B means. Now once I heard that, I realized when you call a person stupid, they become stupid. When you call a person mean, angry, they believe that, they become mean and angry. It's amazing just what we're told, how much we believe, and how much we become. And that is one of the biggest problems, because most of what we're told is criticism. <laughs> we're always told we're not good enough. 
we're always told we're not wise enough, we're not strong enough, we're not pretty enough, we're not working hard enough, we're not sleeping enough. Even these days we're told we're not happy enough. You've been coming to this Buddhist temple for such a long time, why are you so miserable? Please, you are allowed to be miserable in this centre. <laughs> you don't have to be happy. That's one of the worst things in our modern world with this happiness movement. Because <laughs> it's true. There's one fellow I met in a conference, he's the happiness officer of a company. <laughs> and if you're not happy, you get the sack. <laughs> well, not, it doesn't go that far. But even monks, monks, you're supposed to come here and be happy. And that really sucks. I'm not allowed to be upset. I'm not allowed to be grumpy. I'm supposed to be happy because I'm a leading monk. And blah, 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 blah. I demand my right. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I demand my right to be grumpy and unhappy sometimes. Now, you see, what we're doing here is you're not a grumpy monk, you're not a happy monk. All those things which people expect of you, that is what causes the stress and problems in life. So if you feel upset, be upset. If you feel happy, be happy. If you feel sick, be sick. This is one of the other problems, because I told people recently, I remember the story. It was, oh, a long time ago, I was really sick, never knew why, but I went to go see the doctor. Went into the surgery in Byford, and I was sitting there at the surgery, waiting for my appointment, as you all do, you know. You, know, you make your appointment for, say, 10 o'clock, you have to wait till half past 10 or 10.45, you could be dead by that time. And <laughs> but anyway, I was waiting there, I wasn't dying. <laughs> The, at that time, I was often visiting the local prison, you know, incarnate prison farm. And one of the prison officers came into that surgery too. And he really recognized me. I was been teaching meditation and good lifestyle to the prisoners at Carnet. And he looked at me and he said to me, I never expected to see you in a place like this. <laughs> and I felt really guilty. It was like I was caught in a pub or a bar or a brothel or a casino or somewhere. The monks are not supposed to be sick. <laughs> and even if you eat brown rice and are vegan and do exercise and yoga and meditation, you get sick too. So I demanded my right to be sick. So much so, that was the point when I realized, why do people always put this guilt on you? For being who you are. So why is it? You know this because I've told this many times before in this hall. When you go to the doctor, how many of you go into the doctor and said, Doctor, there is something wrong with me. I've got a cold. There's something wrong with me. My breathing is not normal. Never say that. If you understand what I'm talking about this evening, you go into the doctor and say, Doctor, there is something right with me. I'm sick again. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being sick. And I demand sick people's rights. I did it more carefully that time. <laughs> In other words, why stigmatize these things? Because we're always into criticizing, putting people down, putting ourselves down, until we get this identity view of not being good enough. And that is the identity view which causes so many problems for people in this world. And I come across this so often, you know, when people come and talk about their problems, all coming down to the fact that you weren't acknowledged as a, as a human being, that you thought there was something wrong with you from the earliest time of your life. Mothers were always saying, you're not pretty enough, you're not working hard enough, you're not cleaning up your room, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And honestly, the amount of criticism kids get growing up, it's all well-meaning. You, know, you want them to, to grow and become better human beings, but you're doing it all in the wrong way. And because they feel a lot of criticism, and I've seen it. I, I was on a bus some years ago, and I, just, I was doing um, research. I was on a school bus, no, it was a bus which was collecting school kids, sitting down, going from one place to another, I'm not quite sure what I was up to, but listening to how 
teenage kids talk to each other. And there is two girls in the seat in front of me. And one, they must be the best friends. And one was saying, oh, your breasts aren't big enough. And the other one said, but look at your nose, it's too big. And they spent the, and they spent the whole bus journey picking fault with each other. And these were the best friends. I don't know what their enemies said about each other. <laughs> and have you, do you remember that from schoolyard? Always being picked on and all your faults being pointed out to you. And after a while, if you're called a class B kid long enough, what do you think you become? Class B kid. You build up your identity just from what other people tell you. And it's the same with so many other things in your life. You know, you start a relationship, it doesn't work. So you feel a failure in relationships. You, know, you try a job and you get sacked and you feel there's something wrong with you. I don't know how many people keep on feeling there's something wrong with them just the same way that people think there's something wrong with them when they're sick. There's nothing wrong with you. As I like to tell people in Singapore, half of your children, I tell them in Singapore, are going to be below average intelligence. <laughs> now, of course, that's obvious. That's just simple maths. Half have to be below average. But not my kids, no, no, not my kids. Other people's kids, yes, but not my kids. My kids are above average intelligence. Half of your husbands are going to be below average. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, yes, Ajahn Brahm, that's true. <laughs> Mine is. <laughs> Come on, this is the world. Of course that has to happen. But there's nothing wrong with that. And this is actually where, when we say there's something wrong with things, this is where we get into huge amounts of problems and troubles. Instead of saying it's wrong with life, we learn instead just how to understand life. This is what life actually is. People make mistakes, they do the wrong things. But that doesn't make them a wrong person. They're not class B kids. And you're not a class B husband. You're not a class B wife. You're not a class B mother. You're not a class B person. But unfortunately, we make these identities, which is one of the things why in Buddhism, we always say in meditation, well, who are you? Or rather, who do you take yourself to be? And so sometimes I ask people, person, I'll ask the person to do this recently, because they were feeling a bit depressed about themselves. And I ask them, please write all the good things about yourself. I said, no, no, there's none. <laughs> You can see they have this identity view, they're a bad person, they're depressed, they're always late or they do wrong things, they always criticize people. And after a while we have this view of who we think we are. I did a lovely experiment after when I was a monk. I was spending three months in the range retreat with another Western monk. And at the end of the retreat we sat down and we told each other what we thought of each other. Now honestly, two monks. And I was listening to his opinion of who he thought I was. And it was totally different to anything I ever expected. To see myself, I heard myself described in another person's eyes. That was not what I thought of myself. And I did the same to him and he was gobsmacked too. Sometimes, now what we think we are is so far from the truth. But those assumptions of who we think we are get so locked into us that they stop us ha being happy and succeeding in life. Another case, this was from this time I was a school teacher. I love doing experiments. Some of them were maybe not fair, but they were worth it. Because there was a kid in my maths class and the teachers told me he's hopeless at maths. He came bottom the year before. I think it's about three or four classes in this school. And I was his maths teacher for one year, so I decided to find out whether it was because he can't do maths or there was some other reason. So for 12 months, or no, nine months of the school year, after every lesson, I'd ask him, did you understand that, give him extra attention, praise him when he got the thing right, go to his desk you know, during the exercises and give him a bit of a hand, really just give him special attention. 
I say it was unfair because I never gave that attention to any other child in the class, just this one boy. Because I wanted to see whether it was a case that a person just cannot do maths or because they believe they can't do it. And of course it was a second case because at the end of the year, that boy came top. I moved him from bottom to top just by giving him a belief and challenged his, his identity view as someone who just can't do math. I proved it. And it's the same with each one of you. What do you think you can't do in life? Why? Who told you that? Why do you believe that? That becomes your identity view. Who you think you are and a lot of things is what you can't do, what you can't achieve. Which is why to monks and nuns when they say they're not enlightened, I say, yet. You can be, why not? It's only a yet question. Keep on going. There's nothing to stop you except your lack of belief and confidence in what you can actually achieve and do. And it's incredible that if I can somehow get in their heads and tell them, yes, you can do it. It's amazing. They do it. Say with each one of you. Sometimes even just being happy or even being healthy. Now with the cancer support group, why do we think that I've got cancer? Ugh, I'm gonna die. Just that belief is the biggest danger more than anything else. And we think, I am that cancer. You're not the cancer. It's just a thing which is coming into your body for a short time. And it's only in part of your body. What about the rest of your body? Most of your body hasn't got cancer, it's just you know, in the head there or in the heart or in somewhere else. But it's not all over yet. What about focusing about the other part of the body? And say, I'm a being. There's only a tiny part that's got cancer. Changing an attitude like that stops this identity belief that I am sick. You're not only a part of your body, only a small part of your body is sick. The rest is pretty healthy. But when you have that identity view, identity view, my body is sick, the whole lot, of course, the whole body then becomes sick. You become a class B kid. So this is why sometimes the psychology of an identity view, you can make use of that to do whatever you want to do. And you never get fixed into being one thing or another. I love my life as a Buddhist monk because sometimes I get treated as a Buddhist monk, sometimes I do not. For example, when I come through Perth Airport, sometimes they look at my passport and say, Sir, why have you been traveling so much through Southeast Asia? Can we look through your bags? <laughs> they think I'm a drug smuggler. And that actually happened once. I love telling this story. I was coming back from Sri Lanka. This is one of the early trips to Sri Lanka. I don't know what's in Sri Lanka, but they got so many scents and curries, and you know, sometimes you spill things on your robe. So when I came through Perth Airport and was queuing up to the passport control, and they were taking the sniffer dogs up the lines of passengers, up and down, up and down they go. And when they came to me, the dog stopped. <laughs> and honestly, buried its nose in my robe and was wagging its tail ferociously. And the hander tried to pull it away, it wouldn't go. Pull, pull, pull. And when it was pulled away, the person in front of me looked around and took a step further away from me. No, we're not traveling with this guy. <laughs> and the one behind also moved, and everyone was looking at me. <laughs> and then, it takes, you know, you've been through Perth Airport, it takes forever on these queues and lines. And that gave them time to do a, a second check. They came up again, and the dog stopped again <laughs> at me. Right <laughs> now, everyone was really looking at me now. And of course, as soon as you got through the passport control, Come over here, sir. <laughs> and the, the customs officer, he was 
So fortunately, you know, I don't have um, suitcases. I just have my bag. Actually, where is it? Actually, I travel. This is all I travel with. So it's very easy. Have a look inside. It just takes five minutes. He had a look inside. And he said, what's under your rope? <laughs> the <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Every Easter flash <laughs> under the rope. Because, you know, if you've got zips and stuff, it's so hard to actually to, un to take off things. I didn't have to even take off. I just open up and show him. <laughs> it's really good fun being a monk. You can just be a bit, you know, a bit crazy because you're dressed crazy, so people ex sort of expect it. So anyway, and afterwards he said, well, 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 why did the dog stop at you? And I just started to explain about loving kindness and compassion. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and this customer said, get out of here, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so like sometimes you're a suspected drug runner and, <laughs> and other times I, I like going to Sri Lanka now because I'm treated like royalty when you get to Sri Lanka now because the last time I was in Sri Lanka I didn't even need to go through passport control I had someone waiting for me at the gate said come this way sir and they took me to the secret lift in the Colombo airport now I know where that is now. It goes straight down to the VIP rooms. And there you are, you are in this beautiful sofas, just relaxing. When this person comes up, a cup of tea for you, sir. May I have your passport? And so while you're drinking the tea, they do all that sort of stuff. And wouldn't that be wonderful if you go to Perth Airport? They say, just sit down, madam. <laughs> they give you a cup of tea and they do all the passport stuff for you. And what? Once it's finished, they give the passport back and said, your car is waiting outside, sir. Now that's the sort of service we want in Perth Airport <laughs> to attract more visitors. <laughs> that's a, so which is the real Ajahn Brahm, the drug runner or the celebrity? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's wonderful when you can play around and be anybody. And what's that other time, that's other famous story. I'm just going on to old stories because I just like telling them even though you've heard them before. That time when you know, I was busy building a Bodhinyana monastery. And I like building, it's only about a year ago because I was fixing up the roof you know, with that Venerable Mudito on the, uh, the uh, teacher's cottage at Jana Grove. And I was doing it myself up on the roof. Unfortunately, somebody took a photo and put it on the, the the blog, and people said, Ajahn Brahm, you're too old to go on roofs. If you fell off, you'd be losing a teacher, and also be careful, you're so fat, the roof might give in. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not allowed to go on the roof anymore. But I enjoy doing a bit of building, a bit of mixing concrete and messing around with the other monks. You know, it's, a, it's a boy thing, so I was, this was a time when I was, was helping with the concrete work at Bodhinyana Monastery. Your donations, they go a long way. Donations to the nuns, the monks. You know, we actually do a lot of work ourselves and you come along and help out. And so, you know, we get in there. We don't just sit there and just, you know, say wise things. We actually go and do wise things as well, like mixing concrete. Anyway, good fun, good exercise as well. And if you ever mix concrete, it splashes all over you. And that's part of the fun of it, you know, getting dirt down and dirty. So I had all these smears of concrete all over me, it looked a real mess. And I was walking back, you know, to take a shower, when this very well-dressed Sri Lankan woman, high-class Sri Lankan woman, probably very wealthy, you know, we were passing, and she said, I I've, I've come here to see the great monk, Ajahn Brahm. <laughs> Do you know where he is? <laughs> she said, <laughs> and I told her, I said, um, because I was very smart, very thinking very quickly. I said, if you go down to the, the dana sala, the dining hall, you'll probably be down there in about 15 minutes. Oh, very good, she said. And so I quickly you know, had a shower, got changed, went down there and talked to her. You know, she didn't recognize me, <laughs> honestly. Because after talking to her for about 15 minutes or half an hour, she said, oh, that's so inspiring. You're really good, Mark. I'm so happy to meet you. And your monastery is wonderful, but..." if you don't mind me saying, on the way here, I met one of your monks and he was very badly dressed. <laughs> you should not allow that. <laughs> she didn't know it was me. 
And I said quite honestly, I said, oh really? I will talk to that monk later, madam. <laughs> that wasn't lying, I often talk to myself. <laughs> but I like that because they never recognize me. I could be two people without people recognizing. And that is a wonderful thing to be. Which one was the real me? Neither of them. Because when you don't identify with anything, you're not a sick monk, you're not a healthy monk. You're not even a monk. Human being, that's one of the nicest things when people come to the temple. They start talking to the nuns. These nuns were not born in Mars. They are human beings and it's wonderful. You come and talk to them and tell them jokes and enjoy their company. And that's wonderful when you realize that these people are just human beings, just like each one of you. Just because we're big monks does not mean that we're somehow special and have to go traveling in helicopters just to go 70 kilometers. <laughs> I read the news this morning. <laughs> For those who are overseas, that was one of our politicians. You know, sometimes uh, you know, people want to be treated like royalty. And that's one of the terrible things in religion. You know, when the religious people get so separated from reality that, you know, that they do really weird and strange things. So it's nice to actually to, you know, have your friends here and people who you know, actually can bring you down to earth. Because sometimes people tell me that. I do sometimes. When I was uh, away recently, I went to central Java just to give one talk in a town called Magalang. And this is not a big city in Java, but 5,000 people turned up. And I was treated like a rock star. <laughs> Even Lady Gaga wouldn't get so many people in that city. <laughs> and so sometimes people said, they've asked me many times, said, you know, you are getting famous, Ajahn Brahm. Are you afraid that that fame will make you sort of really proud and arrogant and change you? I said, no, because you've got these nuns and monks, they'll pull me down if ever I get any airs or graces. And then I always manage to make sure I do the hard work as well. And, and sometimes you see me, and sometimes people hate this, when I open doors for you. I come in here and I open the door for you. You go in there first. I say, no, I can't. You've got to go in there first. Sometimes you like actually just taking away this identity view of being somebody special because you're a human being. That's what's special about you. Each one of you is special. They were just saying this evening about there were some uh, rules. Only exceptional nuns, they say, can actually come during the range retreat at Dharmasara. And I mentioned that all the nuns are exceptional. <laughs> Every one of you is exceptional and special. There's no one else like you in the whole world. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful to see this. And when you actually start to see that, you start to see the identity view which people have. Why do you want to be special? Why do you want to stand out? Why do you even want to be different? And it's wonderful just to say that that whole judging of being better, worse, or the same. That is what the Buddha said are the three conceits, which is one of the biggest problems for human beings. Wanting to be better, wanting to be, sometimes thinking we're worse, and sometimes we're just all the same. None of them are true. We just don't judge ourselves, which means instead of actually saying we're a bad person, we're a good person, that be honest, sometimes you're good, sometimes you're bad. We change, we make mistakes sometimes. But we always learn and grow little by little. And when we try and judge who we are, please don't judge from the past. It doesn't matter what you did in the past, that's not who you are, that's who you were. And if we always think that we are what we were, there's no way of any growth. We're stuck in the past. And too many of us, you know, we've done silly, stupid things, had traumatic experiences in the past, had bad times. Why can't we move on? That wasn't you. That was another person, another being, a long time ago. So why can't we just let it go? Sometimes people say, no, you have to b keep bringing it up to relive it before you can let it go. And I say, no, 
every part of the past you can let go of if you have the guts, the courage, the feeling of safety that you can do, and also permission. Incredible thing about wanting to have permission to say it is allowable to let go. We're so much creatures of our cultural rules. Somebody sent me this interesting um, email the other day, and it was some tribe which has, you know, been totally untainted by other cultures. That in this tribe, when anybody makes a mistake or does anything wrong or bad, like steals or hits somebody, or he stands in the center of this circle, and all the members of the tribe stand around him. He's done something bad. But do they punish him? No. For two or three days, he has to stand in the middle, and they all tell him wonderful things about himself. What a great person he is, for three days, when he's done something wrong. And I thought, wow, that's whatever that tribe is, that's incredibly wise. Because if someone's done something bad, and you punish them, you're just reinforcing this idea, this identity view, they're a bad person. And instead of getting that, that they already know that they've done something bad, and to stop that cancer of identity view of being a bad person, just in, uh, establishing itself in that person, the whole tribe stands around them and praises them for three days. What a wonderful method that is to stop this identity view of you being a bad person, a failure, a mistake, a sort of a hopeless case. They praise instead. What a wonderful thing that would be that Bombing Bishop, who took that chopper flight, if everybody else in Parliament stood around in a circle and said what a wonderful woman she was. <laughs> you may laugh at that, but what that does, the whole reason why people do bad things is taken away. People do bad things, they make mistakes. A lot of times it's because they've just been demeaned. They think they're hopeless. They think they don't deserve to do good things. And if we'd only get a bit more praise when we were young, a little bit more um, love, care, acceptance, embracing, you make a mistake. Yeah, you made a mistake, but we still love you and care for you. If we only get more of that, there'll be far less people doing bad things in the world. And if you don't believe me, look at yourself. What sort of upbringing have you got? Your history, I'm not talking about when you were a kid, but up to the present moment. If you do bad things, why? Why do you do that stuff? And a lot of times it is because you, know, you don't think you deserve to be good. You don't deserve to be a kind person, a generous person. There's always this sense that that's not who I am. You've been told you're a class B kid, and that's why you, we act like class B kids. But this particular tribe, you did a class B act, but they all reminded you, no, you're a class A person. You're a class A person, you're a class A person for three days. And of course you can see what happens. Very unlikely they ever do that bad thing again. Very unlikely. So when we have these identity views of who we think we are, I ask you, who do you think you are? What are your strengths and weaknesses in life? Who told you that? Do you believe that? If you believe that, then you're attached, you're stuck, and there's no way out. When you doubt that, you doubt all that you've been told about who you are, and all of those experiences you have, when you doubt that, I mean, you can be anything. Yeah, you failed, doesn't make you a failure. You dropped the milk, you've done a stupid thing, but it doesn't make you a stupid person. Which means that you learn, you grow, you learn how to not drop the milk again. Or you're not a stupid person. That is how we grow and learn. But when we have the identity view, it's amazing how many people I've seen get stuck. They're the sick person. They're the angry person. They're the grieving person. They're the addict. They're the drunkard. That's who they become. That's what they expect of themselves. And they keep on repeating the same self-destructive behavior. 
It doesn't work. And it's a shame we have that. They are the soldiers, so they have to be violent. They are the university professor, so they have to know it all. How many people just become know-it-alls because that's who they think they are? Sometimes when I came back from Thailand, I thought I was a know-it-all. I thought I knew everything about Buddhism. And there, there's an experience, I was just sharing this with the monk earlier on, with Ajahn Jaka, he was a senior monk at the time. And I thought he was really, really wise. And he gave a talk somewhere, and after the talk was finished, I thought it was a pretty good talk. This uh, professor of Buddhism came up and said, that's all very well, but that's got nothing to do with Buddhism. <laughs> It totally sort of took him down. And I've had that many times in, in Australia. You cannot pretend in a country like this because people will criticize you. If you say something wrong, they'll tell you. Thank you for doing that. Stops me being in a know-it-all. So I can grow as well and take advice, which is really important. And the other example I remember, which just came to my mind, of uh, one of our ex-caretakers here a long time ago said he became a Buddhist because of an experience he had listening to a talk in Melbourne. Many, many years ago there was a Tibetan Buddhist monk was to give a talk in the public library. And so he went along just for interest, not really a Buddhist yet. And well, this uh, Tibetan monk, just before he got up to give the talk, one of these um, fundamental Christian people stood up and started to harangue the monk, say he was evil, a messenger from the devil, and Jesus was, Jesus was the only way. And Buddhists, being quite gentle, said, OK, you've said your st uh, stuff now, now please sit down and be quiet, we want to listen to the monk. But that just made the Christian fundamentalist even more um, uh, speaking louder and uh, more aggressively. And it took... 45, 50 minutes to get this guy to leave the auditorium. And that's all the time they had for the talk. <laughs> so everyone had to go home. And the monk never said anything. But this young man said that was the most inspiring thing he'd ever seen. Simply because when this monk was being criticized and put down and scolded and said was evil and part of the devil's crew or whatever, the monk was just sitting there peacefully and calm. Even though he's being scolded, he realized that's not what he was. And this is how you can understand just how to behave. If you're scolded, just sit there being peaceful quietly. Then that scolding, that anger doesn't hit you. If you believe that you are wrong or believe what other people say or take that criticism on board, that's when you get hurt. I often say, if people call you a dog, this is Ajahn Chah saying, if people call you a dog, what should you do? Look at your bottom to see if you have a tail. <laughs> you don't believe that. <laughs> if you haven't got a tail, you're not a dog, end of problem. <laughs> so when people scold you, don't believe what people say about you. The other story is if people call you an idiot. This is an obvious one. People call you an idiot. And what do most people do? They start to think, he called me an idiot. He should not call me an idiot. He's got no right to call me an idiot. And that's when you realize he's just called you an idiot three more times. Which means he was right, you are an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you just let it go when people sort of start to to criticize you, why do you take it on board and think that's who you are? A lot of times it's because when people don't know themselves, and not a, they don't understand who they are. They always keep believing what other people say about them. That is why that you're always uh, vulnerable to what uh, people say, which is mostly criticism. One of the things which we train ourselves in, especially meditation, is to be aware of who we are. And when we're aware of who we are, we realize there's nothing much there. You're just a human being. You just make mistakes, you do good things, you have tears and you have laughter, just like everybody else in this world. When you realize who you are, then what other people say is like water off the duck's back. 
So this is one of the wonderful things about meditation. I'm not telling you who you are. You're finding out. You're looking inside this body and mind, understanding what is this person sitting listening to me. And you realize there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing right with you. It's just you, that's all. So which means what other people say doesn't really matter. Which means that you can be at peace with yourself. In other words, you accept yourself. In other words, you love yourself. And when if you can love yourself and be at peace with yourself, then you can be at peace with all beings. But until you're at peace with yourself and understand you can be anything, and you're at peace with anything, you can be at peace when you make mistakes, you can be at peace when you're tired, you can be at peace when you've got lots of energy. You never tie yourself down to one thing. You're changing, just like the seasons, and everything is okay, whoever you are, right now. And that means without an identity view, you have this beautiful sense of freedom. Not tied to the past, but just being, evolving, changing, just like all other beings. Thank you. Very good. So, here we go for some more questions and comments. And complaints, the three C's. <laughs> what have we got today? Yes, hello. Um, I'd oh, like go on to here. Yes, go on. <laughs> One from the um, floor. I'd like to first acknowledge the original custodians of this land. Um, yep. As the Buddhist precepts um, state compassion to all beings, and um, there are billions of beings being constantly imprisoned, tortured, having their children kidnapped, murdered, and things far worse than we c many of us can imagine, all for profit which comes from us, lis um, from us who listen to Dharma talks, then wouldn't it greatly reduce suffering by gently informing and encouraging people to avoid funding these industries like meat, egg and dairy? Therefore, um, I'd just like to request that that becomes a part of every Dharma talk from this point on to reduce suffering greatly. Thank you. Okay, very good point noted. Very good. Okay, very good. Questions here. Uh, from Spain. I think we don't have the same mental capacity. If someone has an identity view that they are mentally limited, could that be true and it's not a judgment? Uh, I've noticed that many people who have supposed to be having some mental um, deficiency uh, or other physical impediment. I mean, one obvious example is Stephen Hawkins, who's got a physical impediment, but has got incredible mind. And there are other people who seem to have, you know, maybe diagnosed as autistic, who still can have incredible um, gifts which other people don't have. So, uh, when you say mental capacity, uh, sometimes I, I was not going to tell this story because I tell it very often, I told it very recently. It was the time when I went to the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore. And on that sort of uh, talk, um, I mentioned similar things which I've mentioned this evening. And afterwards, this fellow came up, he wanted me to bless his ward. I asked what he does in the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore, and he was a professor of schizophrenia. And I asked him how he taught, how he treated schizophrenia. And that's when he said, I do not treat schizophrenia as a professor of schizophrenia in Singapore. He said, I treat the other part of the patient, the other part which is not schizophrenic. And that really inspired me so much because he understood what I could see. Is a person schizophrenic or are they a person? And they got much more than that label they told they are. And I asked him afterwards, what is the result of your treatment? He said, much better than normal treatments. Because he was seeing, it was not sort of some mental incapacity. Sometimes it's a label which is put on. And the more you encourage that label, the more you identify with that label, 
the more you become a schizophrenic. And by treating the other part of the patient, which was not schizophrenic, he was taking away that labeling, that identity view. He was getting incredible good results in it. So sometimes when your kid is diagnosed as, say, OCD, what happens? You treat them like an OCD person. You expect OCD behavior. Sometimes it encourages that behavior, obsessive compulsive disorder. So how about not labeling and focusing on the other? It's a person who has exhibited OCD symptoms, but doesn't make them an OCD person. Not class B. Because otherwise a person becomes a class B person. So, could that be true? It's not a judgment. Sometimes the judgment makes the truth. The judgment makes a person. So sometimes it's interesting to know that. Are they mentally incapacitated? Obviously, I've got to be very careful here because I don't want people to actually to stop taking the medications. Th there is a problem there, so take those medications, but also see the other part of you as well, which doesn't need those. But keep on taking them in the meantime. And lastly, from the US, I identify myself as a Buddhist, but I have trouble practicing Buddhism in a Western society. Any suggestions to help? It depends what type of Western society. In many Western society, Buddhism is very cool. And it depends like how you practice that Buddhism. And I think you must have all seen, because I don't know how many people have sent me this email, that uh, the Wimbledon men's champion, Novak Djokovic, he was going to the Thai temple in London every morning, which is just around the corner from the, uh, the tennis courts in Wimbledon. And he was going there every morning you know, to meditate and just relax before his matches. And that's why he won sort of the Wimbledon men's tennis championships. And it's also why the Australian players didn't do that well, because they never came to the Buddhist temple. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know why I have trouble practicing Buddhism in a Western society, because it usually fits in pretty well. Now, if you want to go, you know, ceremonies and stuff, and chanting and banging drums down the street, obviously that doesn't go down very well. But it's like keeping precepts, being a kind person, being compassionate, meditating, then that goes down very well in most Western societies. So I don't know really what the, the problem is there. It is from the United States. Maybe you're in a part of the United States which is still quite backward. <laughs> when it comes to religious freedoms and tolerance for difference. But you know, some parts of the United States are just, they're still not really totally recovered from racism. So, you know, it takes a while for them to open their, their minds to different views of religion and the truth about the nature of the world. But there are many parts which are very open and hopefully that you're living in one of those parts of the US which is very open, where people can practice Buddhism. For example, obviously in California, Buddhism is very, very popular. Even the governor of California, Jerry Brown, he's a Buddhist. There's many other people are Buddhists in the United States. So it depends actually where you are from the United States. In some places, you know, there's still, again, a uh, need to sort of come into the real world and move forward. Uh, but in some parts, it's still you know, a little bit sort of behind the times. Hopefully, you're living in a place which is uh, ahead of the game. Okay, so that's the, any questions from the floor again? Okay, so we can wind up now. So we usually pay respects to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and then we can all go and take a rest. <laughs>